So today we're going to continue with our discussion of liquids and solids, uh, looking at section 3, which involves network atomic solids, mainly using looking at carbon and silicon. And then next time we're going to discuss the other two types, which are ionic and molecular solids. Okay, so network solids are basically an atomic solid with a strong directional covalent bond. So it's this really big, giant molecule. Uh, some properties, they are very brittle. They will not conduct heat or electricity. And so we're going to look at the two main types, carbon-based ones and then silicon-based uh, compounds. So let's look at some examples of carbon first. One of the main examples of carbon is diamond. So each carbon atom is in this crystalline structure. There's uniform bonding. It's a tetrahedral arrangement. Okay. It can be a gigantic molecule, and so that's one of the definitions of a network solid. It's a network. It has to be big. Okay, also we've got covalent bonds going on because they're all carbon atoms. And if we looked at the localized electron model, which if you remember, we look at the type, the number of bonds around each one. Uh, this is an overlap of sp3 bonds, okay, because it's a tetrahedral arrangement. And uh, if we look at the molecular orbital model, we have a large gap between filled and empty levels. Okay, so that's a little description on the two main models if we look at bonding. Because of this big gap, electrons can't transfer easily, which is why it's not a good conductor. It's actually an electrical insulator, because something that's not a good conductor can be a good insulator. Um, and also, another property of diamond, besides it you know, being pretty and sparkly, is that it's very hard because of that structure. And so it's used in a lot of cutting instruments because the diamond won't wear out, and so it might be expensive initially, but that cutting instrument can be used for a long time. Okay, the other uh, form of carbon, which by the way, these are called allotropes, right? Because we've got same atom, different types, different way of bonding together, so that those are allotropes. Graphite has some different properties. It is very slippery. It's black. It's a conductor. Um, and it's basically pencil lead, so that's why it can write on your paper. You wouldn't want to try to write on your paper with diamond. It wouldn't work out too well. So these carbon atoms are bonded a little differently. We've got these layers of carbon, and they're fused in ring shape. So instead of tetrahedral, we have these rings, and then they're in layers. And so if we look at the localized electron model for this, because we have these six-member rings, um, each atom is bond has three bonds, and so that's sp2 if we look at localized electron model. And since we've got those p orbitals, they're going to form pi bonds. Um, and so that helps give us some electrical conductivity. These are similar to conduction bands in metal crystals. And so um, if you think about the way that graphite is bonded, it is slippery, right? Glides on your paper. So that means that we have bonding within that horizontal layer, but very little bonding in between the layers. So it still stays together, but it, it can move. Um, it is cheaper to make diamond from graphite, and so you would apply a very high pressure at a high temperature and turn your graphite into diamond. So we can artificially, I guess you could say, make diamond. <coughs> okay, the other element that we're going to look at for network solids is silicon. So silicon is fundamental in most rocks, sands, and soils. It's a big part of that stuff, um, and usually we will get chains of SINO bonds, so silicon bonded to oxygen a lot. It basically is as important in earth science as like carbon is to biology. So, you know, carbon compounds and organic compounds are present everywhere in biology. Silicon's present in earth science. Okay, one of the forms of silicon is silica. And so the fundamental component of this is called quartz, which is SiO2. Um, and even though silicon and carbon are close to each other, so SiO2 and then CO2 on the periodic table, um, they are not similar at all. CO2 forms double bonds. Okay, if we look at CO2, so we've got these double bonded oxygens, but that does not happen with silica. In fact, even though the base, the basic structure is this SiO2, it actually, when it forms together, forms these networks, okay, because we're talking about network solids, of SiO4, and then the oxygen 
atoms are shared between all those structures versus having like these separate SiO2 molecules. So that's why it's a network solid because they're all bonded together. Okay, another form of silicon is a silicate. And again, this is based on the SiO4 structure, uh, but it's a little bit different. The O to Si ratio is greater than 2 to 1. And part of the reason for that is because we have SiO anions. So when we put that SiO4 structure together, because the ratio is not 2 to 1, it creates this unbalanced charge, and so we have these negatively charged compounds. Well, in order to balance that out, we need some cations, and so we take any type of salt. So, you know, calcium is the example here. We need a metal cation, and then the polyatomic SiO anions, and that creates a salt. And so here you can see that we have the Ca2 plus cation bonding to create that network. A third form of silicon is glass. So this is when silica is heated way above the melting point and then cooled very rapidly. And so we've talked before about amorphous solids, and that's where you have this very un, kind of unorganized structure. And so when we go from sand, which is silica, to glass, because it's heated, or sorry, cooled so rapidly, it that structure gets kind of all messed up. But it's still a network solid because it's this big compound. Uh, we can change the properties of glass to make it better for our use. Um, if we add B2O3, it creates a special type of glass called Pyrex. Um, basically, a lot of your cooking dishes are made out of Pyrex because they won't expand or contract very much in heat changes. And so that makes them more stable, like for making lasagna or whatever. Um, Na2Cl3 is added, and a general common additive, just common glass um, that you would find anywhere. And then K2O is added to make the glass very hard. And so for things like um, your lenses and your glasses and things like that, where you want more durability. Okay, we also have ceramics. Now, these also contain silicates and some other things. Ceramics are basically made from clay uh, that you fire at very high temperatures. But ceramics and glass are very different. They have some different properties as well. Uh, it, it, ceramics are very strong but they're really brittle, so you drop it, it's probably going to break. They are also resistant to heat, which is a nice property, um, and resistant to attack by chemicals, so they can be used for a lot of experiments and things like that. The only problem is that, unlike glass, ceramics cannot be remelted as many times as you want. So you can take glass, heat it up really hot again, it's going to turn back into a liquid form, and you can reform it or whatever. A ceramic won't do that. Once it has been fired and heated, that structure is stuck. Glass is homogeneous and a non-crystalline structure, whereas ceramic is kind of the opposite. It's a heterogeneous, and basically it's a mix of two different phases. We have these tiny crystals, okay, and then they're suspended in like a glassy cement, okay, and so that's where we're getting our two phases. Ceramics are really important, though, for really high temperatures because they can resist that heat. And so for engines and things like that, they create a really high temperature fuel efficiency, and they also resist corrosion, so they're really good for those kind of uses. We can try to reduce the brittleness of ceramics by adding a small amount of organic polymer, and this polymer is also being used for things like artificial bones because they are less brittle, but they're still hard and, you know, kind of like a real bone, so those can be used in those type of things as well. So we said the ceramics were made from clay that is fired. So let's look at clay real quick. This is produced from the weathering of water and carbon dioxide on what's called feldspar, which is a mix of those silicates. So they contain silicon. And when this happens, it produces kaolinite, uh, which basically contains these thin platelets. So if you, you know, remember from biology, Platelets, like in your blood, would go to, like, if you cut yourself or whatever, and they, they kind of form almost not to, well, kind of to clot it. And so think about platelets like that, these thin things that can form on top of each other. When clay is dry, all of those platelets cling together, okay, and so it creates this solid. When you get clay wet, then those platelets are going to slide across one another, okay, Clay is very slippery when it's wet, and it can be formed and molded into different shapes. So once we form the clay and then fire it, 
basically those platelets get bound together and that's where we have those little crystals and then the glassy cement that's binding them together. And so if you take a look, um, here's some our glass granule and some other you know parts of the clay. After firing, remember we talked about that glassy cement. So that glass, because remember we said we can reheat glass as many times as we want, right? So if we fire it, it heats up. And then it binds all those other granules together, okay, creating this crystalline structure. Okay, another use of silicon is in semiconductors. And so a semiconductor, semi means partially, so it'll partially conduct electricity. And the interesting thing about semiconductors that is not true with metals is that the conduction will increase as the temperature increases, and so they can withstand these higher temperatures, which is really convenient. So if we look at silicon, in a semiconductor, it has the same structure as diamond. And we talked about with diamond, there was that large gap um, between the molecular orbital models, the filled and then, you know, the empty ones. Well, with silicon, the gap is a little smaller, and so some of those electrons can cross the gap. Because when we talked about diamond, we said it wasn't conductive because that gap was too big. And with silicon, because that gap is a little narrower, some of those electrons can cross, allowing it to semi-conduct electricity or only slightly. Okay, there are two main types of semiconductors, n-type and p-type. So we'll talk about n-type first. Here we're increasing the conductivity by doping it um, with certain other elements. And specifically, we are using elements that have more valence electrons than the host atoms, so silicon. So arsenic has more valence electrons than silicon, and so we're replacing some of the silicon atoms with arsenic. And so uh, what happens is because we have more valence electrons, those extra electrons like close in energy to the conduction bands, and so they get easily excited and we can better conduct electricity. So here we've got uh, some arsenic atoms and then they're donating those extra electrons, and so these extra electrons are here, and they're going to help go from the empty band to the filled band, and that's what's going to conduct electricity. Uh, here's another example. We used antimony was added as the impurity, um, and then it's got these free electrons that are going to move around and help increase conductivity. And the other type of semiconductor is a p-type semiconductor, where n-type had elements with more valence electrons, P-type has elements with less valence electrons. And basically, this creates empty spaces or holes that electrons can jump to, and so that facilitates the flow of electrons. So pure silicon fills a molecular orbital model because it has four valence electrons. Okay, if we take one away, now we're creating an unpaired molecular orbital. And so this functions as conducting electrons, which makes it a better conductor. Because now instead of having an, an extra electron that's free to move, we have a hole where other electrons will go to. Okay, so oh, let's go just, okay, so let's just take a look at the picture real quick. Here we had our impurity was boron, and then here's the hole that other electrons can jump to. So we can put p-type and n-type semiconductors together and create a p-n junction. And so basically we're connecting the two types of semiconductors, and because p-type has that missing electron and n-type has the extra electrons, those electrons can migrate between and that's going to conduct electricity. So it puts a negative charge on the p region and a positive charge on the n region and then that contact potential or junction potential, that's where they're together. And this prevents other electrons from migrating, so the only migration is going to occur between these two. So let's just take a look. So here we have the missing electron, and then here's our extra electron, so one with more valence electrons, element with less valence electrons, and that's going to facilitate the moving of electrons. Okay, we also have what's called a rectifer, and this basically converts alternating current to direct current, and we can use PN junctions to create these. So we can connect terminals in two different ways. If we connect the negative terminal to the P region and the positive terminal to the N region, then the flow of electrons is going to be opposite of natural flow, so we call that reverse bias, and no current is going to flow. So if we switch the way that things are connected, connect positive to the P region, okay, so here's our positive terminal, and then connect uh, the negative terminal to the N region, 
Um, that's called a forward bias, and current is going to flow really easily. And so this is what a rectifer is. It's converting that current. It's used in a lot of electronic devices. So if the current goes, you know, is flowing, then basically we're going to be able to light up the light bulb. So electron flow is this direction, and hole flow is this direction.